Hello, subscribers and YouTube followers. We're so glad you found the Life Lessons Publishing Channel and hope it's a blessing to you. The sermons we provide on our channel were recorded while I was the senior pastor of Northwest Church in Federal Way, Washington. And our hope is that you'll grow as a disciple as you listen and watch. However, I want to tell you about another resource we have for you, our books. As a nonprofit organization, we give away our books at no charge to anyone who wants them. This isn't a gimmick or a way to get your email address. We're simply trying to fulfill the calling God has for us to equip the saints by providing solid Bible study materials for pastors, leaders, and, and you, the hungry Christian who wants to grow in your walk with God. If you're interested in receiving whichever one of these books, please email us at info, I-N-F-O, at lifelessonspublishing.com, and we'll send you a book. We won't keep your email address or try to contact you later. Our heart is for you, the committed believer, to step out in the calling God has on your life. And you need to know his word well in order to do that. Now, here's our latest video. May God bless you as you watch it. Father, we ask for the word of God to come alive. We ask, Holy Spirit, now that you would open our eyes and ears and that we would hear and see the things of God. We, Lord, incline our hearts to be soft, to receive that which is yours, to let the seed be planted and to grow. And we pray, Lord, that uh, as we hear it, we would be given the faith and the grace to obey. I pray, Lord, for a prophetic word now and a call to our congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to, uh, now let me tell you where we're going today so you can kind of understand the, the course we're, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 30, and then I'm going to talk to you about the passage of the anointing oil. But um, the anointing oil was something that was intended as a basic prayer. And I'll, I'll explain more about that. It was an invocation calling God by the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon that place and upon those priests. It was an invitation. Lord, come in your power. Come with your with your presence and move. And then I'm going to show you the answer to that and the fulfillment of that uh, later on. I will begin by reading chapter 30, verse 22 and through, through, through 33. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take also for yourself the finest of spices, of flowing myrrh, 500 shekels, of fragrant cinnamon, half as much, 250 of fragrant cane, 250, of cassia, 500, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil, a hin. I'll explain more about this in a minute. You shall make of these a holy anointing oil, a perfume mixture, the work of a perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony, and the table, that would be the table of showbread, and all its utensils, and the lampstand, and its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering, and all its utensils, and the laver, and its stand. And you shall also consecrate them, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them shall be holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, that they may minister as priests to me. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on anyone's body, in other words, for personal use, nor shall you make it like any like it in the same proportions. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it, or whoever puts any of it on a layman, shall be cut off. From his people, meaning separated from the spiritual congregation of Israel. Now we've seen the Lord uh, instructing Moses to build the various parts of the tabernacle. Now he's saying, I want you to make a special oil. And I want you to take this oil and I want you to anoint the various parts of the tabernacle. The tent itself, I want the various pieces of furniture, the altar out in the courtyard, the labor in the courtyard. I want you to anoint all these things, putting that oil, that sw sweet smelling oil on those various articles. And then I want you to take the priests, Aaron and his sons, and I want you to, in that case, they're going to pour it on them. They're going to take a horn of oil and just drizzle it over their head. It's not going to be a little dab. It's going to be an entire horn of oil poured over them 
as a prayer. Oil has been used symbolically since at least the times of the patriarchs. In Genesis 28, Jacob poured oil on a stone which had been his pillow during a vision of God. In this way, he acknowledged that the place was filled with God's presence. You see, this, this spiritual family, right from Adam and Eve on downward, have, have seen oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Elsewhere in the Bible, the anointing with oil is used as a symbol of receiving the Holy Spirit. Priests, prophets, and kings were anointed with oil to signify that God had set them in a special place or function, equipped them for his service, and empowered them by placing his spirit on them. The word anointed means to apply an ointment or oil-based solution to a person or object. When used this way, the oil represents the presence of the Holy Spirit coming upon and remaining on the person or object. By the way, let me insert a comment. In Matthew chap or Mark chapter 6, Jesus, we see that Jesus taught his own disciples to anoint with oil. And I mean, that is not simply something we've extrapolated. Jesus taught them to anoint with oil as they prayed for the sick. In order to provide a special anointing oil for the priests and tabernacle, the Lord instructed that aromatic oils from certain spices be mixed into a gallon of olive oil. That's what a hin would be. This would produce a lovely smelling oil that left a lingering fragrance. His recipe called for four spices, myrrh, is a scented resin from a desert shrub. Cinnamon is a brown spice we're familiar with today. And cane and cassia are scented spices from India. If the recipe meant 50 pounds of dry powdered spices were added to a gallon of olive oil, the result would have been a thick paste, something like a child's clay or something. You wouldn't have poured it on them, you'd have stuck it on them. You know, here, be... <coughs> yeah. So when the reference is made in verse 25 to a perfume mixture, we're being told that a perfumer boiled the sweet-smelling essences out of this amount of spices and mixed the perfume into the olive oil. The tent, all its articles of furniture and utensils, along with Aaron and his sons, were to be anointed with this special perfumed oil. This action invited the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit and set apart those people and objects as holy. When you anoint with oil, you're saying this, come, Holy Spirit. Say that with me. Come, Holy Spirit. It is an, it's a, it's a, a prayer. It's an invitation. Come, Holy Spirit, in power and remain on this person. If you're asking for that, for that permanence. That's why, and the sweet smelling odor was added to it so that as a person was anointed, you, you'd smell that and remember the point is that you'd smell the beauty of the Lord's presence and remember that he's there, that he's, that he's come upon you. So they're praying, come Holy Spirit, come on this tabernacle that we've built. As we built it in accordance to your guidance, come now. Just to have a tabernacle isn't enough. We need you. And upon these priests, these, these, these people who are going to do ministry, come upon them. May the power of the Holy Spirit be on them. Now let me show you the answer to this prayer. It's in chapter 40. I'll begin at verse 33. Chapter 40 tells us that Moses set up all the things that God told him to make. All the tabernacle is put in place. All the articles of furniture are arranged. And then it says he erected in verse 33 the court, that would be that outer fabric linen, linen wall uh, around the tabernacle making a courtyard and the altar and hung up the veil for the gateway of the court, meaning the front door. Thus Moses finished the work. Now look what happens, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So that great cloud that goes probably thousands of feet into the sky moves over, right over this tabernacle, and then the Shekinah glory, the presence of the Holy Spirit, filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now Moses was used to having that cloud at the gateway of his little tent when he prayed. He had spent 40 days at a time in that cloud and could handle that amount of the Lord's glory. In this case, it's so powerful, he can't go in and stay on his feet. 
And then it says that that cloud remained with them over that tabernacle and the cloud would actually guide them. And as the Lord moved, they would follow him and his presence remained in cloud by day and fire by night. That's the answer to the prayer of putting the oil on all these things. The invitation was, come Holy Spirit. Come and remain on these, on these people and on this place. And the Lord's answer was to have his Shekinah glory come and fill that place with power. I believe the Lord wants us now to, to exercise faith, to move forward so that his power will come at a new level. I am not discounting that the Lord is doing marvelous things and doing wonderful things in individuals and that there are very spirit-filled and spirit-led people. There are. I think that's why we can even have such a sermon. If there weren't, I don't think we'd even be having, the Lord would even be calling for this. But I believe he's calling for us as a people to believe him for something greater. How many of you would like to see a real revival, a real move of God among us? All right, now this second question is more challenging. How many of you would be willing to personally change whatever the Lord asked for so that that could happen? That's where the rubber meets the road. What I want to propose to you today is that you and I can have such a move. That it is not something that is, um, you know, well, God just might do it and he might not and who knows and, you know, don't these things happen in, in, in ancient history and stuff, but not really today. I want to sh I'm, going to, I'm going to share with you some key steps that if we want the power of God to move, and I'm going to try to capture in your imagination what that might look like, that we can have it. That it's not a matter of if. I don't know when, but I know we can have that because I know the Lord wants to do that more than we want it. So I, if, I, if I were going to ask you and say, what would a mighty move of God look like? People would probably all have a different picture of it. One person would say, oh, I know what a mighty move of God would look like. Everybody would fall down. Well, they might. But, you know, I don't know that falling was, was the point. I mean, if they do, fine. Or you say, I know what a mighty move of God would look like. Everybody get loud. Well, they might, or but they might get quiet too. So I don't know that loud or or silent would be really the issue. What would be, at least in my mind, what would be the real evidence of God anointing a church? I think it would be that God himself is tangibly present and evidently at work. That when you see that, that, that fellowship of believers, when you see those people, what you see is God working through them, not something that is well orchestrated or, the, or can be explained by psychological or sociological factors. You know, you can build a religious movement without God. People do it all the time. You can build churches without God. You can, you know, you can so have the, 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 what, the best sermon or the hottest worship, or you can have the, the best looking foyer, that would be it, and, uh, uh, you know, or the most proper parking lots, and you can go all kinds of ways to sort of ease people into a religious experience. That does work. It does work. But it's not the same thing at all as a revival. That's not what a revival, or it's not what, 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 that's not the kind of thing you, you see at an early church. I have, over my life, I'm old enough, I've been through a, several environments where there was what I would call real revival. And the, the thing is, you don't remember just the, the, the preach. It wasn't about, we're all going to hear the preacher. The preacher's so good. Or the worship, oh, it's perfect. They, you know, they just, oh, the transitions are magnificent. And, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's not about that kind of thing. In fact, I can tell you this. If people go away and say, wasn't the sermon wonderful or, or didn't he preach it well, it's been a failure. If you go away and say, I go there because the worship is the kind of music I like, it's clear we don't have revival. You couldn't say it any more clearly. It's sociological for me. I like certain kinds of music and I don't like others. Or I like, I like to be cared for this way and I don't like others. And when you start talking that way, you've just proven you don't have revival. You have a church that is being sociologically engineered by good leadership. I don't mean everything's false and I don't mean everybody's false in it. 
I'm just saying there's a difference as to why we come together and what happens among us. I've been in places where, where, where the concrete was electric. I mean, you, you just as you come into the environment, you can just sense God's here. And you can see it on people, and you, can, and you can sense that what's gathering all of this and causing all of this is like a cloud of glory. Something is there way beyond the skills of these leaders, way beyond the way things are being done. It isn't about that. In fact, when I think back, I hardly remember who was doing what or, or anything like that. I remember God. God was there, and God was at work among them. What would we do? If we wanted to move into a season where we would have such revival, such a move of God, what kind of steps would need to be taken? There are classic, ancient, historical steps that, and things that have to be there if this kind of revival is going to take place. And I want to go down those. What brings it? First of all, it's prayer. And now I, I, I got to... Not just any prayer. It's believing prayer and it's persevering prayer. And I would say it's specific prayer. It's where you begin to pray believing God to do such a thing. Come Holy Spirit. Come and do a mighty work among us. And where the people of the Lord set themselves to pray that way. An example. I find all kinds of interesting books on my mother's bookshelf. It says, When the Spirit's Fire Swept Korea by Jonathan Goforth. And... Uh, I was reading uh, through this, and he's describing the remarkable moves of God in the early years of Korea. I don't know if it stopped in that nation, um, and how, how the church grew. You know, it's only been about over, just over 100 years that, that Christianity's been in Korea, and I think it's now nearly 50% of the population is Christian. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a remarkable uh, um, remarkable testimony what's happened. Well, he, what, he, he, what he describes here, go, go forth, let me step back. Go, go forth would go someplace. Jonathan go forth was a missionary. And he would go someplace uh, and he would begin to preach and people, people would commit to prayer. He'd call them to prayer. And then as they began to pray, the conviction of the Holy Spirit came over the people and they would begin to confess their sins. I warn you, that might happen. So maybe think, we'll have to think carefully about this. They would begin to confess their sins. In some cases, uh, uh, elders would stand up and, 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 and confess that they'd been stealing money from someone they were, you know, that kind of thing. Um, he's got an example in here of a guy stands up and says, I'm Achan. You remember Achan in the Old Testament? And he begins to declare and tell this uh, one of the lead elders. And, and these kinds of confessions began to bubble up. And people began to weep. Not because anyone scolded them or had some sermon where they're just hammering them about morality or anything. It's just the presence of the Holy Spirit begins to settle over the people. And they also confess their bitterness toward each other. You know, the, the strife and the, the feelings about each other. Those things begin to come to the top. And people begin to reconcile. And to, to love each other and to forgive each other. And as the church goes through this process of cleansing and of being reunited in love, a revival would break out. And, it would, and you'd have thousands, tens of thousands of people would, begin, would be, be saved and, and gathered into the church and lives changed. And it was just literally, it was totally unexplainable. It wasn't that there was a hot band, you know, playing over here or this kind of thing. It was that God so swept the place because the people had sought him. I just want to describe a, uh, just a simple example. There's a whole book full of, of these examples. But he's talking about some of the leaders deciding to have a prayer meeting. And it says here, they, this is over and over, this theme is they would decide, let's pray until God moves. Now that's a key. They would decide to, let's pray until God shows up. And they already had church. That wasn't it. But they wanted, they, the, 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 the Chinese and the Korean Christians understood what could happen. They, they, they got it. I mean, they were seeing it around. So they said, Let's, we're, we're going to pray until we see this kind of move. Now listen to this. He said, um, some, of the, some of the leaders returned home to Pingyang. Forgive me if I butcher the language. Uh, humbled, they were over 
20 of us in the, in the Methodist and Presbyterian missions at Pingyang, we reasoned that since our God was not a respecter of persons, he did not wish to give greater blessings in the Cassia Hills than in Pingyang. They'd had this great outpouring there, and so this group says, well, we want it too. So if they can have it, we can have it. It's just, it just, that's just a simple logic. So we decided to pray at the noon hour until greater blessing came. After we prayed about a month, a brother proposed that we stop the prayer meeting, saying, we prayed about a month and nothing unusual has come of it. We're spending a lot of time. I don't think we're justified. Let's go on with our work as usual and each pray at home as we find it convenient. Doesn't that sound like a well-said uh, exit? The proposal seemed plausible. However, the majority decided to continue the prayer meeting, believing that the Lord would not deny Ping Yang what he had granted to Cassius. You see, somebody got feisty. Said, we're not letting go till we get our blessing. Right? They decided to give more time to prayer instead of less. Oh, my. With that view, they changed the hour from 12 to 4 o'clock, and then they were free to pray until supper time if they wished. There was little else than prayer. If anyone had an encouraging item to relate, it was given as they continued in prayer. They prayed about four months, and they said the result was that all forgot about being Methodists and Presbyterians. They only realized that they were all one in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was true church union. And it was brought about on the knees, and it would last, and it would glorify the Most High. And then he begins to describe what happened, and, and thousands of people began to come to the Lord. This decision, it says, let's pray till we get our blessing. And you notice it's corporate. It's corporate. It's not everybody, but it's the core. The core begins to say, we're not letting go till you show up. We're going to apply the oil, and we're going to believe that the Shekinah glory will fill this place. We know what can happen, and we're not letting go till we get it. That is the kind of attitude. Now, here's, here's a, a book that one of the, one of the church council left on my, on my chair uh, about a year ago. I was, I was feeling a little discouraged. We'd gone through all sorts of changes and, and uh, things that happened, and, and he even I still got his note here. It says... Uh, I know uh, we, uh, the council and others, have looked at the uh, attendance numbers. And at that point, we had its decline um, for a number of reasons and have been concerned about our church. I think we know what we need. I think Jim Simbola reminds us of us, and that's his book. Uh, it's called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. I think we sell it in the bookstore um, for that, this reason. This isn't anything new, and you probably have this book, and others buy him on the shelf, and I did. And I had read parts of it. The message was a reminder to me that it's his spirit that will do, it, will do it. He will build his church. My prayer is that my God will increase in me a longing for him such that I will thirst as the deer pants after the water. Well, I took it home and I began reading. And it's like I woke up from a dream. It's like I'd forgotten something. I'd forgotten the power of prayer. Jim Simbolin and his wife, uh, he wasn't even trained as a pastor, but his father-in-law was a, a church leader in, in New York. And, and they had this open church building in, in Brooklyn, very beat up, uh, very few people, and they needed a pastor. And he said, why don't you just go in there and cover it for a, until we can find somebody. And, and so he and his wife had gone into this, this, this very difficult situation. And by this point, he's, he's just discouraged out of his mind. And uh, somehow they, they decide he's in such bad shape that they send him out on a fishing boat to j just kind of fish. And uh, he's had all kinds of pastors telling him about church growth techniques. You know, you could do a fleet of buses or you, if, you, if you just did this particular thing, um, you know, here's how you grow a church. All that sociological, psychological stuff that uh, goes out there where you feel that you have to somehow crank out a church. And, and he said, I didn't even have the money or the know-how to do it if I wanted to. And so he's out on this boat, and he says, uh, he says I, we had to have a visitation of the Holy Spirit or bust. He said, Lord, I have no idea how to be a successful pastor. I prayed softly out there on the water. I haven't been trained. All I know is that Carol and I are working in the middle of New York City with people dying on every side, overdosing from heroin, Consumed by materialism and all the rest. If the gospel is so powerful, and then he stopped, I couldn't finish the sentence. He, tears choked me. Unfortunately, and fortunately, the others on the boat were too far away to notice as they studied their lines in the blue-green water. Then quietly but forcefully, in words heard not with my ears, but deep within my spirit, I sensed God speaking. 
If you and your wife will lead my people to pray and call upon my name, you will never lack for something fresh to preach. I will supply all the money that's needed, both for the church and for your family, and you will never have a building large enough to contain the crowds that I will send in response. I was overwhelmed. My tears intensified. I looked up at the other passengers still occupied with their fishing. Nobody glanced in my direction. I knew I'd heard from God, even though I had not experienced some strange vision, nothing sensational or peculiar. God was simply focusing on the only answer to our situation or anybody else's for that matter. His word to me was grounded in countless promises repeated in scriptures. It was the very thing that had produced every revival of the Holy Spirit throughout history. It was the truth that made Charles Finney, Dwight L. Moody, A.B. Simpson, and other men and women mightily used of God. It was what I already knew, but God was now drawing me out, pulling me toward an actual experience of himself and his power. He was telling me that my hunger for him and his transforming power would be satisfied as I led my tiny congregation to call out to him in prayer. Well, he established a prayer meeting. I think his was Thursday, Tuesday night. And he just said, as, as this prayer meeting goes, so goes the church. It's going to be the heart of everything. We're going to believe God and just stand praying and see what he does. Well, of course, the result was a, a magnificent congregation that never has, he's never had room for. Uh, he can hardly, I think he, is, he, he can't even get people in. Um, they have overflow rooms in their prayer meeting. Uh, and they are a mighty force in the heart of, of uh, New York. They're praying. They're praying. His wife doesn't read a note of, of, of music. She's put together a magnificent choir called the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. They've sung at Lincoln Center and all of the places. They pack it out. They have multiple services for the thing. And people come and say, we don't know why we feel what we feel when you sing. I do. <laughs> They're praying their little hearts out and believe in God to move in a mighty way. And he does. You, you get the picture? This is something we could do. Would God, if God will do it in Brooklyn or if he'll do it in Korea, would he do it here? Yes. Do you think so? Or does he not like King County and Pierce County? He says, no, 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 too many pine trees. <laughs> do you think he'd do it here? Yes. Well, what would hold him back? Us. Yes. If you and I can get the vision, if we can get this thing in our heart and say, just like those people those in, in Ping Yang, we are not letting go till you show up. Yes. We're going to set ourselves. We will pray consistently until we have a move of God. I believe we'll have a move of God. As simple as that. The tabernacle has been built. We need the oil. We need the power. We need the glory of God now. Not to just fill the building. The building is immaterial. To fill us. To move among us. And I, for one, I, you know, I'm getting older. Maybe you noticed. <laughs> Running a church better, I could, I mean, I'll do, I'll do my job. I'll do the best I can, you know, uh, which is whatever. But that doesn't get me up in the morning. What gives me joy, what wakes me, my heart up, is the thought that God would have a revival among us. That God would sweep through King County and Pierce County. That we would begin to see a move among the broken, drug addicted, divorced, sad, hurting people. And that we would see thousands and thousands. Not, not a matter of church growth. We can't, you know, it's not a matter of, of let's fill a building. It's wouldn't it be wonderful to have churches just sprouting up like mushrooms? Wouldn't it be wonderful to see people getting saved by the thousands? And lives being changed. The real thing. Not, not there's some hot preacher that did the thing. Or, or that band is so cool. Uh, we like to go there rather than there. But that unbelievers are brought to life. Yes. That to me is revival. Yes. Watching the lives change. And I'm, by the way, I'm already seeing that kind of life change. It's going on now. And it's why I think God even can have this word to us. I'm watching people coming out of darkness and getting born again. And their lives radically changed. It's already working. It's already happening. And I believe that if we pray, it will simply ramp up. And there will be a great increase. Prayer is the first thing. Righteousness is another. 
I won't take time to sort of hammer this point, but I just, I'll make it simply. God observes the character and the personal lives of the core of the church. We will have people come in, and we want them, who have maybe robbed a bank that afternoon. I mean, you know, we, we, we'll watch the offering, but we'll... <laughs> We're, we expect sinful, broken, addicted, troubled people. I mean, that's what church is about. You want them to come to church for heaven's sakes. But God watches the core. And he knows who the core is. That's who he evaluates in terms of character. And with us, there can be no funny business. With us, we cannot have hidden lives. With us, he requires a pure, uh, uh, not perfection, but integrity. In other words, if there's, if there's areas that are going on that are troubled or addicted or hidden, they need to be confessed. They need to be, they need to be uh, we, need, we need to seek out real care and accountability. We need to be in, in integrity moving forward with our lives, not having hidden secret lives. The example of Achan in the Old Testament is, is just a clear example of that and actually one that, that uh, Jonathan Goforth uh, mentions. But Achan was one of the, one of two million people. You say, well, does my little life count when there's thousands of people? <laughs> it would count, it, one life counted when it was millions of people. <laughs> yes, it does. I know this personally and, and we just need to understand this. What you and I do in private affects the corporate life of this church. That is how deeply we're connected. There's no getting away from that. What I do in private. Achan had stolen uh, some, some of the loot which was dedicated unto the Lord. And when they took the town of Jericho, that's where the walls fell down. He, just, he took a bar of gold and he took some silver and he took a, a robe of Shinar. He took some beautiful garment. And he buried it in the floor of his tent. Didn't think anybody knew. And as they went to battle on the next, on the next, on the next uh, encounter, they were badly beaten and people died. And as Joshua went to the Lord, he said, what's wrong? And he said, someone has stolen. Someone has stolen and hidden it. And so they found it out and, and cleansed that and the, and the protection and the blessing came back. We cannot be hypocrites. Our personal lives do matter. And I understand that you can tell me about, you know, people that have uh, large ministries, uh, that have character lives, that are, that are flawed badly. And I would say those are psychologically and sociologically explainable situations, but you don't have real revival. I'm not saying people aren't getting saved, but I'm saying it isn't really a work of God, not this kind of work. The Holy Spirit is a tender Lord. He's powerful, but he's also like a dove. And you cannot be a phony. You can be, imp we're all imperfect. We all struggle. We're all tempted. We all have issues. That's not the point. But we can walk in integrity. We can seek help where we need it. We can confess our sins regularly and honestly. We can pursue Christ-likeness. We can do that. It's a choice. The third thing that we must have is unity. We must have prayer, we must have righteousness, but we also must have unity. There must be no bitterness or judgmentalism. God does not show up when people don't love each other. It's as simple as that. Harboring attitudes, dividing into sectors and little groups will kill the anointing of the Spirit always. You cannot fool, we cannot fool him. He knows, he knows our hearts. In Ephesians, he calls us... Well, let, turn with me briefly to Ephesians chapter 4. Just, want, just get a sense of what St. Paul asks of the church in Ephesus. Verse 1. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
And then he talks about how one we are in the one body, one, one faith, one baptism. Later on in verse 30, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but by, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. To do that is a lot of work. To have love is a costly Job. Love is not automatic. Put us all in a room, lock the door, and we'll hate each other in a week. You know, I mean, we'll offend each other in a week. Let me say that. To love each other requires that I determine not to harbor an offense. If I realize that I have been offended, I will go and seek reconciliation quickly. If I realize that I have offended someone, I will seek reconciliation quickly. Now, I don't go through a week... But what I offend somebody. And this week was no exception. I found myself, and I was looking at somebody, I was talking to them, and I could just tell by their face that I had, that something was wrong. But I could not, for the world of me, think what it was. Later on, I, I, I just saw that. I didn't even, nothing computed. But I said, is everything okay? Well, indeed, as, as he replayed back what I had said, I said, I said that? Yes, you did. Ooh, I didn't, I didn't mean it like that, but I had said that. Why did I seek him out? Why did I ask? This very reason. I have learned that if I allow a bitterness to be harbored at all in my heart or, if, or anyone else's, anywhere I spot it, if, it's, if it continues, it lifts the anointing. It lifts the presence of God. It does in a family, by the way. Just as much as it does in a church. If you want the anointing of God, there must be love. When one of the attitudes you have to have with this, and we're going to have to have it broadly as a church, is I will not allow old bitternesses to continue. If someone apologizes to me, I am going to release them, and I'm going to choose to love them again. Now, that's the hard part. You know, you, you can often say to somebody now, do you forgive me? Yeah, yeah, I forgive you. Kind of like, get out of here. I forgave you. <laughs> but I don't ever want to talk to you again. That's not the kind of love God looks for. He's looking for tender-hearted, true reconciliation. That is what's Christ-like. That is what is unusual. That is what is supernatural. That kind of love for one another. We determine to love. I would challenge us that wherever there is bitterness, wherever there is a separation, that we seek to reconcile it and to cleanse our own hearts. And part of that process, I find, is to refuse to allow a bitter thought to come in. I can wake up in the morning and, and effortlessly remember all the offenses, you know, they just start spinning by my brains. Anybody else know what that's like? You don't look for it, you don't ask for it, you don't want it. It just, there it is, it's just scrolling down all of the stuff. I am recognizing that this is a, a, an assault by the devil intended to take my heart just as much as a lustful thought or a greedy thought or anything else, a violent thought, it is a temptation of the devil inserting at a point where he thinks I'm weak so that I will bite into this thing and begin to rehearse the offense. You see that? And when I spot it, I say, no, in the name of the Lord, stop it. And I, I mean, that's why I, I have to take my mind and put it on other things. I will not rehearse that offense. I will forgive. I will bless. Why? We want the anointing. I'm telling you, church, this is not, this is not me being funny or cute. I know how this works. This is part of the equation. Prayer, righteousness, unity, and then I'll just, I'll just briefly say the last personal, real transformation. What do I mean that, by that is this. I don't think you can have revival without people being genuinely born again. And listen to me, I don't think everybody that goes to church and calls themselves a Christian is born again. In fact, I'm beginning to suspect that much of American Christianity is not 
born again. Born again isn't believing in Jesus. Born again isn't going to church. Born again isn't, isn't getting your act together. Born again isn't trying again uh, to do it right the next time. Born again isn't even being sorry for the mess of your life. Born again is, in, is actual clear decisions that are made in response to specific issues of the gospel. The first issue is this, the Holy Spirit must convict you of sin. Sin, not that you smoke and chew and go with girls that do. It, <laughs> the kind of sin that the Holy Spirit goes after is unbelief in the Lord, that you lived rebelliously and independently from the God who, who made you and from the Lord who died for you. That's the sin he goes after. And he, and he, he convicts you. And there comes a point where you say, I repent. Oh God, forgive me for living independently from you. From wanting to live rebelliously and free of your influence, I submit my life to you. Secondly, you, the Holy Spirit will show you that Christ is the Son of God and that on the cross, he paid for all of your sins. Now, knowing that with your head does not save you. The devil knows that with his head. You must reach out and believe him and say, you died for me, I receive it. I will trust in your death on the cross and your resurrection to the last breath in my body. That's my hope to stand before God and be welcomed into heaven. Nothing I've done, but what you have done, I trust it entirely. That's an active, aggressive choice you make. And finally, there's another element. You must surrender all. That isn't... You don't know what that will mean. It's a general attitude of life. But you say this, Lord, from this point on, my life is yours. I will no longer be my own living for myself. You died for me. You bought me with a price. And from this day forward, I sell out on all the things of the world. And I choose to follow you. And that's one where people aren't ready. I had somebody the other day come to me and, and he, he'd felt he'd come to the Lord when he was 10, but he was living a wild life now. And, and he said, well, somebody told me Jesus would never leave me. And I said, well, the Bible also says that if you know him, you'll not practice, continue to practice unrighteousness. So apparently something didn't take. And I said, let's, let's go through this. And I took him through the little green brochure on the new birth. And I came to that surrender part and I said, you have to be willing to die to your own life and to live for Jesus Christ to sell out entirely and I said are you ready for that he says no I'm not I said well that's an honest answer and you know where you are now and when you're ready when you are ready to sell out you come see me I noticed he was here <laughs> this week another service looking at looking at me you know, and from the back and uh, and I'm thinking go God get him get him Lord Just get him He's a, he's a sharp guy. When the guy comes to the Lord, he's going to be a leader. But he, he's just not ready to surrender. Now, when you do, you get born again. And when you get born again, your spiritual understanding opens up. A person who's not born again cannot really see or comprehend the things of God. That's why you get such muddle in so many religious sectors. They, don't, they, they call themselves Christians. They think they're Christians, but they're not born again. So they're not even understanding the things of God. So there must be a new birth and there must also be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That, is an, in, that moves us into the life in the Spirit. The New Testament is meant to be a Spirit-led, Spirit-empowered life where we walk with the presence of God. It's not about just do you speak in tongues. It's about having, giving all of yourself to the, to the working of the Holy Spirit and letting Him have His way. That is what's beautiful and powerful. Do we want revival? Let's ask those questions again. How many would really like to see a move of God? Amen. Secondly, how many would be willing to make personal changes like these to see that it would happen?